Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built. And this week we are doing the final engineering rundown on the Al Ferrari. All right, guys, before we get into it today, I just want to take a second out to thank this week's video sponsor, which is FlexiSpot and their E7 standing desk. So standing desks are really useful in an office situation or you're working from home. And if you're sitting all day, every day, it, uh, it would definitely help uh, your, your, your posture and everything to be able to get up and move around and, and change the height of the desk. I wouldn't know because that's not what I do. I've never worked in an office in my life, so uh, I don't have that, uh, uh, that use case. What I do have is now a fantastic workstation for the garage. There are lots of benefits of having a standing desk as a workshop table. And uh, I'll show you for starters, if I lower it down, the way I currently have it set up, at its lowest point, I am looking at about, uh, about 65 centimeters high. And then if I raise it up all the way up to the top, keeps going, keeps going. It goes up to a monstrous 1.3 meters. And it's still super stable up at this height with all this stuff on it. Like it is amazing in the garage on my dodgy floor that it's still really stable at 1.3 meters high. That is ridiculous. Another big benefit is that um, it has a huge capacity. It can carry 200 kilos lifting and 250 kilos static. So it's uh, definitely a robust unit. And the amount of times that I am working in the garage and particularly welding and things like that, where I'm working at different heights and I'm continually moving around to be able to just change the height of the, the desk because welding is really specific on being comfortable. And if I can make myself comfortable by getting the height of whatever I'm working on at the exact right point to make me comfortable, it's so much easier. So this is gonna come in very handy. It also has the casters on the bottom, so I can just move it around and then lock it in position. So I've, I've got a mobile bench, which again is something that I'm really big on with everything in the workshop. Another really handy feature of the table is that I can set, put in presets. So I can just press one button and preset the height so that it will come up and I've matched it to my existing bench. So I have a nice even height and I can set this up across the workshop and lay things over the top of multiple benches to get them all the same height. Makes working on things easier. Now I was shocked at actually how affordable these standing desks are. And if you go and use my code in the link in the description, you can get an extra $50 off. Thank you to FlexiSpot and uh, make sure that you help out the, uh, the companies that help out the channel. Keeps this, uh, this whole train moving along. All right, back to the video. All right, guys, welcome back to another very cold episode of the Al Ferrari. Uh, those who don't know it, this is my 1973 Alfa Romeo GTV 2 liter that I've swapped in a 2000 model Ferrari 360 V8. If you've missed it, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up. And like always, do the things, like and subscribe and comment. That all helps out that uh, crazy algorithm. So where we left this car, uh, I've been working on it a lot in the background. There's lots of little tiny things that I wanted to get sorted out. And it's just tedious stuff that is not really working well on camera, but I'll take you through some of those things now so that you can sort of see where we're up to and what I need to do moving forward to get every little thing done. And hopefully we can get this car registered for the road. All right, so a lot of the work that I've been doing on the Al Ferrari in the background over the last few weeks has been little sort of tedious things like doing more work on the gauges in this car. Now, I've mentioned in the past that I'm not uh, entirely happy with the Speedo and Taco. I still will probably change out the, the 
gauges of them at some stage, but at this, th this stage they are currently working and doing what they need to do. The other gauges I have, uh, the oil pressure, the oil level, the fuel level and the water temp are all Raceworks gauges. Now, uh, the two oil gauges were working and I've had them working for ages. But a lot of you commented in the background, if I turn the ignition on, and give it a second, And if you can hear that, there's this beeping going on in the background. And that is the Raceworks gauges. Let me just turn them back off again. Basically, that's the Raceworks gauges in uh, alarm telling you that they are out of spec and they're, they're uh, faulting and uh, not giving you accurate readings. That's because the fuel and water temperature gauges, I'd never connected. So they were... Uh, not doing what they were supposed to do. And so there was a bit of work in getting the uh, fuel gauge connected, and that was a matter of measuring the resistances of the fuel level sender in the tank and matching that up with the options on the gauge, because this gauge has features where you can uh, select lots of different types of sender to uh, give you your signal. And I did that, the gauge works fine. The water temp was much more troublesome because uh, at first, I tried a, a while ago to tap into the, the same sensor that my electronic water pump and thermofans use, which is a, like I've got a, a, its own unit controlling that. And you can't branch into the sensor. It throws the readings out and the whole thing doesn't work. So uh, that didn't work. So what I had to do was I had to get an output from my Link ECU and then program that output to work with that gauge and uh, basically there's enough parameters there that I could program to do anything I wanted uh, and read any signal I wanted but it just uh, was just a matter of calibrating everything in the software. So I had to sit there with a the laptop and go through and set up the parameters and then uh, adjust my outputs uh, from the ECU so I can, I can adjust the output on that signal to the water temp gauge to actually make the gauge read the same as what I'm actually seeing here. So it doesn't necessarily output you know, 20 degrees as 20 degrees. It's a certain percentage of the gauge swing and I have to match that up so that it matches up with the markings on the gauge. And that's all working now without installing a third temperature sensor into the, uh, the mix and doing all this stuff. So that was a, just, that sort of stuff is very time consuming. I had to learn the software and things like that. And uh, yeah, and it's uh, now I have all of the gauges are all functioning. In any case, that side of things is all doing what it's supposed to do now. So uh, let's move on to some of the other things that I need to start tackling. So as the engine is warming up, you can see I have a taco that's working, um, the fuel gauge is now working, and oh, what I'm doing is I'm calibrating the temperature gauge. So currently it's reading 40 degrees at the engine. This gauge doesn't start taking off until 40. And I have my coolant temperature here, and as I go through, I need to be able to adjust the numbers in these boxes so that the gauge reads the same thing. So I have to adjust my settings because my needle is wavering quite a bit. I'm not exactly sure what the setting is. Uh, I've got used tried the on delay and off delay. I'm just not quite sure on, on why it uh, varies that much, but uh, it does. So we'll just uh, work with it. At least it works. At least I have a gauge that reads somewhat accurately. Alright, so the next thing that I've been tackling and diving under the dash here doing is trying to get the power steering to work in this car. So originally I put in Toyota Yaris power steering and to get that to work, in theory, should be relatively straightforward. So you need to have the control box, so the power steering control box out of the Toyota, which I've got here. And there's 
only sort of a few wires you need to connect. So um, you have to make sure that that is obviously connected to the uh, power steering motor itself uh, with the original cables, or in my case, I've uh, joined them up again. But basically there's a large power and a large ground going into the box, which is your main power for the motor itself. And then you need to have another small power to one of the pins. And I found a really good site called the Ranger Station, who did a whole thing on the Yaris power steering conversion. And they showed the wiring and the wires you need to connect to get it to work. And if I can connect up this one power signal to just power the unit on, it's not getting all of the information it would normally get from the Toyota computers. So it just runs in a fail safe mode, which is what I'm looking for at this stage. To get this into a fail safe mode, basically what that does is it gives you just one setting of power steering over everything. Whereas normally with particularly the electric power steering, it's connected to a speed signal. So the faster you go, the less power steering you get. So you still get nice uh, feeling at speed, but when you're slow, it gives you more power steering so you can turn the, the wheel. And that's a nice feature, which I believe I might be able to set up. There is a speed signal input, but for st the time being, I just want to get it running. So let's see if I can get it to work. All right, the power steering, I can hear the module switching on, but I'm not sure whether it's actually doing anything or not as I'm not actually driving the car. So I'm gonna to have to physically go out and test it, which uh, we'll do at a later date, but I've done what I can, can for now. So let's tackle the next thing, which is my horn is not doing what it's supposed to. All right, spoiler alert, I don't get the power steering working, but I am continuing to work now on the horn. The issue is that the spring tab I made a long time ago in a previous episode, for some reason is not actually touching the ring on the bottom of the boss kit. So I just needed to space it out with a plastic washer and I have a working horn. All right, we have a horn that works. All right, next thing I want to tackle is this, is the bonnet window is sticking up around the edges. It basically, it's just been held in by silicon and that's let go or Sikaflex or whatever you want to call it. It's not holding it because it's held in a slight curve the whole time. It's always pulling against it and uh, just with opening and closing the bonnet and stuff, it's come free. So I want to bolt it down and uh, I have some... Uh, countersunk fasteners here, so let's uh, get into that. So this is a great tip for painting hardware, just find an old piece of cardboard and stab some holes in it with a screwdriver. So now I'm marking out where I want my fasteners on the Lexan window. I'm just drilling pilot holes to start with before I flip the bonnet to drill all the way through so I don't drill holes in the engine. And the test hardware fits nicely, so now I need to go through and countersink the holes for the uh, countersunk fasteners I'm using. I do need to get myself another countersinking drill bit. At the moment I'm just using the 10mm bit which is the right size for the hardware. Not recommended. Can definitely go too deep if you do it wrong. Alright that bonnet's looking much better. The power steering is not working but I think it might be uh, re-looking at the wiring I might need to connect up a speed signal to the power steering ECU. I've got the wiring there. It's potentially not going to take me that much because there's already a speed signal going uh, to the speedo and to the ECU. So I've got that signal there. I just need to connect it up. So we'll see what happens as far as that goes. I'm going to have to play with it again later. But for the time being, you can drive it as just the steering when, particularly when you're just sort of trying to crawl around, it's really heavy. But that's all I can do for the time being. Uh, that's Pretty much ready to go. I like everything works. The horn works now. All of the lights work. The brakes work reasonably well. They're still not as good as what I would like, but uh, they are much better. Uh, the most things are there. It's just little tiny bits and pieces. It's so fiddly with a build like this where everything has been touched. 
to try and make every single piece of the build work to the extent of what I wanted it to. And um, look, we're getting there. It's just, um, yeah, still fine tweaks, but hopefully a lot of that can be worked out once it's on the road. It's perfectly safe and working and good for a road car. At least I hope it is, and uh, we'll see what the engineer says. But um, yeah, there's there's going to be shakedown tests as we go. So the appointment with the engineer is actually about three hours away from me, and I can legally drive this car on the road to that appointment, uh, even though it is not currently registered. But it's too far that if something happens, if it breaks down along the way, then I'm stuck, and it just it's much easier to just put it on the car trailer take it down and do the testing, trailer it back, and we see how it goes. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. So uh, let's load it on the trailer, and uh, fingers crossed, I will let you know how the engineering all goes down. Well, that was a long day of engineering going uh, three hours there, three hours back, and uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, it was uh, quite a detailed process, and uh, it's not something I can sort of film. The, the engineer's not, uh, uh, hasn't signed up for that sort of thing. But I'll go over basically what the process is, at least uh, in New South Wales, to get a car like this registered. So basically, he needs to go over everything. He needs to document and photograph every single modification that I have done to this car and check that everything complies with the uh, existing standards. And that part of it took probably two hours of going through every single little thing documenting everything, making sure even just basic things like the VIN number is correct and things like that. And then the big tests that I had to do were uh, the noise and emissions test. Uh, now with the extra mufflers in there, I'm now at 88 decibels. I think I can go up to 93 from memory, so I was miles underneath that, had no problems with uh, sound and the emission. So basically what they do is they put a, a gas probe in the exhaust. They need to check, uh, it's a four gas test. I can't remember all four of the gases that they do, but they go through and check basically that the catalytic converters are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and apparently some aftermarket cats still don't get enough. Uh, some factory cars even struggle getting to, to the emissions into the window, but the Alferrari, tuned nicely and particularly with the link ECU it runs closed loop and it's set to run uh, at stoichiometric at uh, an AFR of 1, uh, 1.0 and uh, that can go up to 1.05 or down to 0.95 and uh, I was sitting straight bang on, on 1 and that meant that all my emissions were well within spec, I was well under uh, what I needed to be so emissions wise everything was good. And then we, the last thing was he had to set up the brake pedal sensor and take the car for a brake test. But the Alferrari has been driving me crazy with the brakes. As you guys know, the brakes have been a nightmare. And for some reason, this, it's still dragging a brake. I've put a spring on the, the pedal to bring the pedal, uh, bring the pedal back so that it's, uh, it's all the way off. But there still seems to be some tension in the brakes and I can't physically push the car. And even when you're trying to take off, it often sort of burning the clutch to try and get it to roll because it just won't roll. So being manual brakes, it's got me thinking that pretty much the only thing I can think it can be is that there's still a bit of tension. Uh, basically, the, my, my brake pedal rod is too long and it's just holding just that little bit of tension on the mass cylinders. So um, it is adjustable. I'm going to get that up in the air and adjust that. But uh, as it was, he couldn't take it for the brake testing. So 
We haven't got a brake tested, but I'm booked in again for the 19th of August. Uh, I can actually drive it to the brake testing uh, place. It's still about a 40 minute drive, but uh, I'm gonna drive the car there and drive the car back. So uh, fingers crossed, 19th of August, that's the last. He's happy with everything else. It's good. There are a couple of little points I've got to touch up, which I'll cover in uh, uh, next episode. Uh, minor things, the battery needs to go in a battery box and things like that. There's just little rules that we have to uh, comply with. So I'll cover that next time. But I think that is enough for this week. So um, I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, unveiled at the 2019 Geneva Motor Show was Ferrari's successor to the 488, the F8. The F8 uses the same 3.9 litre twin turbocharged V8 as the 488, but with an extra 50 horsepower, taking it to 710 horsepower, and with a claimed 0 to 100 in 2.9 seconds. The exterior styling has also been updated and Ferrari chose to return to the quad taillights, which hadn't been seen since the 430. The F8 was available. The F8 was produced in two variants, the Tributo, which is a hardtop, and the Spider, which is a convertible folding hardtop. All right, so um, yes, still, still haven't finished. We're getting closer with the uh, Ferrari and lots of things are starting to sort of uh, tie together. Every time I, I tackle, I start getting some more of those little bits and pieces like you saw me tackle in this episode. So now we have gauges that work and uh, just more things are getting there, which is uh, nice to see. But it would be nice to actually get it on the road and the brake testing is the last thing. So I'm, I'm going to tackle that, get stuck into that a little bit more. The brakes are still dragging. There's a rear brake still actually uh, after another test seems to be locking first just before the uh, the front. It's it's almost even, but uh, it's still not good enough. So more to come. Lots of things to tinker our way out. Yes. Yes. If you want to help Jeff out on his mad journey with crazy cars, Patreon, and see the videos a day early, no ads. Otherwise, like and subscribe. And Jeff loves reading your comments, so keep keep on replying and. Um, <clears throat> so as you may have noticed, my pronunciation has approved, improved, mm -hmm. not approved, it's improved because I've got my new tooth. Yes. So yay. Mrs. Jeff has had like, uh, yeah, had so, major dental surgery like 12 months ago. It's been so 12 months So thanks for ahead. everyone putting up with my stumbling, slurring, and um, just general mispronunciation. <laughs> yes. so, thank you. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Hey, guys. Yeah. Unveiled at the Geneva Motorsport in 20... Motorsport? Motor show was Ferrari's successor. Let me do it again, I'm still getting used to talking. Hey guys, whew. The F8 uses the same twin turbocharged V8. Two variants, the Tributo, which was a hard- Tributo. Yes. Done, smashed it. <laughs>